when should you pull the goalie in hockey? I did the math, and this chart gives the answer. Hockey's an aggressive sport, but today we're talking about the most aggressive strategy, pulling the goalie for a six on five. It essentially gives you a power play on offense for a better shot at tying up the game, but it can also make you look very stupid. So when is it worth it? I built this model to get the answer. This graph shows how aggressive you should be based on the game situation, the goal differential, and the time remaining. Ahead, be conservative. Behind, be aggressive. Less time, bigger deficit, more aggressive. That's just intuitive. But the numbers on this graph are not just vibes. In this video, I'll show you how they were computed based on a mathematical definition of aggression. Pulling the goalie is a very aggressive tactic. Based on our definition, we are going to calculate that it's a 4.14. And from that, our chart will imply that we should pull our goalie in exactly these situations. Down one with three minutes left. Down two with eight minutes left. Down three with 12 minutes left. But where did these numbers come from? Let's dive in. This is WageWorld and I'm Nick Wage. Let's start with a simple win probability model. We want to know, based on the current margin and minutes remaining, what is our probability of winning the game? Let's start with the simplest case, zero minutes left. Behind, we've lost, and our win probability is zero. Ahead, our win probability is one. If it's tied, we go to overtime. So let's say our win probability is 0.5. To start working backwards, let's consider the down one with one minute left box. Goals are rare in hockey, but not that rare. So let's say that in any given minute, there's a 10% chance we score a goal, a 10% chance we are scored on, and an 80% chance that nothing happens. Down one with one minute left, this gives us a 10% chance of tying up the game and going to overtime, where we have a 50-50 shot at winning. It also gives us a 10% chance of being scored on and losing the game by two, plus an 80% chance of nothing happening and losing the game by one. Overall, this gives us a win probability of 5%. We can apply this exact same logic to the tie game one minute left box. That gives us a 10% chance of winning in regulation, a 10% chance of losing in regulation, and an 80% chance of going to overtime where it's 50-50. That works out to a 50% chance of winning if we're tied up with one minute left. And that's exactly what you would expect, which is a good check that our math matches our intuitions. We could apply this logic to calculate the win probability for every box on the one minute row. And once we have the one minute win probabilities, we can again use this logic to fill in the two minute row and so on, filling in the entire grid. Let's check these numbers make intuitive sense. A tie game is 50-50, no matter how much time is left. Big deficits give us a low win probability, and big leads give us a very high win probability. When we're down by one, we're always an underdog, but the more time is left, the better our chances of coming back and winning. All that checks out. Our graph seems pretty reasonable. The key input was that 10% scoring probability. Changing that changes our answers. Suppose we increase the chance of a team scoring in any given minute to 30%. Now, it feels like anything could happen. Comebacks are easier, and that compresses the probabilities towards 50%. If we instead use a 2% probability, the opposite happens. Even small leads seem insurmountable, and the game feels more determined. That moves the probabilities towards 0 and 1 and away from 50%. The point is, this scoring rate is important. So how do we choose the right value? Well, looking historically, teams score 2.32 goals per game. A game lasts 60 minutes, so they're scoring 0.04 goals per minute. And that's exactly the value we're looking for. Let's say each team scores each minute with 4% probability. Now that we've got solid win probabilities, we can get back to our original question of when you should pull your goalie. This is actually just one instance of the more general question. How aggressive should you be? What do I mean by that? Hockey teams want to one score and two not be scored on. I mean, duh. But think about it. These are importantly separate goals that trade off against each other. Suppose our defenseman has the puck near center ice. He could hang back and dump it to a teammate, or he could be aggressive and take the puck forward himself. We call this play aggressive because it increases the chance we score, but also increases the chance they score. That's what aggressive means. But what makes an aggressive play a good play? Imagine the game is tied up with 10 minutes left. Our win probability is 50%, but scoring would increase it by 36%, and being scored on would decrease it by 36%. These probability changes are equal, so scoring is as good as being scored on is bad. Hypothetically, let's say the defenseman's aggressive dive increases the chance we score by 1%, but also increases the chance they score on a counterattack by 2%. We want to determine whether this is a good strategy, whether it will increase our chance of winning. To do this, let's take the product of the chances dive succeeds with the win probability we stand to gain if we score and subtract the product of the chances dive fails with the win probability we stand to lose if we're scored on. If the result of the operation is positive, that means we gained win probability and the dive is a good strategy. In other words, we hope the product of these terms is greater than the product of these terms. So when the game is tied, the decision is not a good one because the negative product is larger. But let's consider the same calculation with his team down one. This changes the calculation. His current win probability is 14%. And just like before, scoring increases it by 36%. But being scored on only costs him 12% win probability. It's somehow not as bad as it was before. And it's also not as bad as scoring is good. And when we plug this new value in, it changes the balance. In this new situation, the aggressive dive increases our win probability. Even though it leaves us open for a counterattack, the cost of being scored on just isn't that high. 
We only started with 14% wind shear, so of course we couldn't lose 36%. Going from down one, where we were already in tough shape, to down two just isn't that bad. In a way, our real fear is that the next 10 minutes will pass with no goal scored. We need to make something happen. We want to increase our chance of scoring, even if it also increases our opponent's chance of scoring, because if nothing happens, that's bad for us. That's why we want to be more aggressive when we're down, and it shows up in the math. This equation has four terms, two of which depend on the game situation, and two of which depend on the particular play we are considering. So let's rearrange the equation to group them that way. We can think of each of these ratios as an aggression coefficient, and say that you should only make the play if the aggressiveness of the situation calls for the aggressiveness of the play. We've assumed that the aggressiveness coefficient of this play is two. It gives up two goals for every one goal it gets us. But down one, that's okay. The win prob gain from scoring divided by the win prob loss from being scored on is three. That's the key number. And we can calculate this aggression coefficient for every game situation. So we just saw that when we're down one with 10 minutes left, our aggression coefficient is three. If I'm down by two, the aggression coefficient is 5.8. If we're tied, we already saw it was a balanced situation with an aggression coefficient of one. And the gain from scoring equals the cost of being scored on. If I'm actually up one, then I'm feeling conservative. My aggression coefficient is only 0.3. Let's fill in this aggression coefficient for our entire graph and then do some sanity checks. Sure enough, tie games are balanced no matter how much time is remaining. The less time and the bigger the deficit, the more aggressive we feel. Whereas with a bigger lead, we feel more conservative. All this checks out. And now we're almost there. We just need to figure out how aggressive pulling the goalie is. The goalie is the most defensive player, so of course pulling him is aggressive. Getting that six on five will increase our chance of scoring a little bit, but it will greatly increase our chance of being scored on. What we need to know is the ratio of these two probability changes. Remember the defenseman dive example? In that case, we wanted the ratio of win probability gain to win probability loss to be bigger than the ratio of the dive's increase to their score probability to the dive's increase to our score probability. So we want to find the same ratio for goalie pulling, and we can get this from historical statistics. Remember, a typical team scores 0.04 goals per minute. Looking at the numbers, a team with an empty net scores 0.11 goals per minute, which is 0.07 more goals. For context, that's similar, but a bit worse than a power play, which I think makes sense. But they get scored on 0.32 times per minute. That's 0.29 more goals against. So we've increased our goals per minute by 0.07, while increasing our goals against by 0.29. The ratio here is 4.14, and that's the aggressiveness of pulling our goalie. We are giving up four times as many goals as we're getting for ourselves. Normally, that's a terrible trade-off. But when our aggressiveness coefficient is bigger than this ratio, it's worth it. And those are exactly the situations where we should pull our goalie. Looking back at our chart, it's exactly this region. And that's the answer. Well, almost. This aggression coefficient chart looks a little different than the one I showed in the intro. Why? Well, there's one more bit of complexity we can add to this model. When we created our win probabilities, we were assuming that neither team would ever pull their goalie. But like we just saw, pulling the goalie changes how common it is for each team to score a goal. That means that our 0.04 value for the probability of scoring or being scored on would change. Just for the fun of it, we could calculate the win probability graph assuming that one team has their goalie pulled the entire game. If we do this, we see why that's a terrible strategy. The win probabilities get lower almost everywhere on the graph. But for a few cells, it actually gets a little bit higher. So instead of just pulling the goalie all the time, let's do the following. Let's calculate our win probability if we don't pull our goalie, then calculate our win probability if we do pull our goalie, and then choose the higher value. We can do the same thing for the other team. Calculate the win probability with and without a goalie pull, and then choose the lower value, since our opponent is trying to minimize our chance of winning. If we do that for the entire chart, we get a new set of win probabilities, which take the goalie pulling strategy into account. Then we can calculate our aggression coefficients from this new win probability chart, and we get our real final table, the one from the intro. This table tells us when to pull our goalie, but that's not all it does. I think it can be used more generally by coaches to help players make good decisions on when to be aggressive. How? It's a bit unintuitive. After all, our defenseman with the puck at center ice doesn't have time to calculate ratios in his head before getting clocked. And even if the coach is able to quickly communicate to his team that the game situation has an aggression coefficient of three, what are the players supposed to do with that information? If I was a coach, here's what I'd do. Instead of explaining any of this win probability stuff to my players, I would tell them to imagine we're playing a version of hockey where we're just trying to maximize the expected score differential. Don't worry about whether we win or lose, just try to maximize our score minus their score, regardless of the current situation. This is the right strategy in a balance game when the aggression coefficient is one. Then during the game, I would look up the aggression coefficient for the current game situation and tell my players to start pretending that our goals count for that many points rather than just one. So for instance, down one with 10 minutes left, our goals count for three points. Down two, our goals count for 5.8. Don't worry about the current score, just try to maximize the expected future score differential, our points minus their points, while keeping in mind this point multiplier on our goals. So if the game is tied and the current aggression coefficient is one, our defenseman will worry about the counterattack and hang back. But if we're down three with 25 minutes left, my chart says to show a 3.6. So he'll throw caution to the wind and go for the valuable score. Into the circle, McCarr shoots and scores! A brilliant goal by Caleb I really think that treating aggression coefficients as point multipliers would help players make better intuitive decisions about aggression. Oh, and if I ever showed my players a coefficient of more than 4.14, I'd know it's time to pull the goalie and replace him with an offensive player. Thanks for watching. This has been Wage World, and I'm Nick Wage.